I'm very happy to see you here. We see very good intention to meditate and gain insight. Insight into who we really are. Nothing could be more important in this life than to do that. And if one finds out how it helps one in, in daily living, one becomes more and more committed to this practice. I think that many of you will have meditated before. Some of you may not have done so at all. Anyone here who hasn't meditated at all? Good. Two. Everybody else has done something, huh? For all those that have already meditated and have used this method or that method and have had this kind of viewpoint and that kind of opinion and this teacher and that teacher, how about forgetting the whole thing? <coughs> Just for the time that you're here. The minute you leave the door, you can pick it all up again and use it all over again, just for the time while we're here together. No comparisons, no ideas, <coughs> beginner's mind. We've got to begin each day new. If we don't, we can't experience it. So what we're going to do here, we'll begin a practice quite new so that we can really experience it. Of course, the benefit of previous practice is a more trained mind, one that can stay a little easier on its appointed spot, but that's all. Everything else has to be experienced right now. The past is irrevocably gone. The future is the yet to come. The future is a hope and a prayer. It never happens. When it does happen, it's called the present. We can't live there because it doesn't exist. It's fantasy. In the past, well, we can't live there either. It's disappeared already. It's gone. Our memories are notoriously faulty. Whatever we remember may be half-truth. The only thing that we really can know are our experiences. And they are happening right now. in order to gain the greatest benefit from meditation practice. One has to know exactly what one is doing. If it's questionable, nebulous, not quite clear, if it's still a hope for something better or a viewpoint, it doesn't really have the impact it should have. So it is important to gain a little understanding of what meditation can do for us and if we practice it a little diligently, will do for us. There are many methods. The Buddha taught 40 different methods. A method is a method by any name. It will never be anything else. It's just a method. And when real meditation starts, the method can be abandoned. Most methods 
are just as good as other methods. There is hardly any possibility to say this one is better or that one is worse. What we can say is that we feel more comfortable with one method than with another. And that's about as far as it goes. There are 40 of them, but there are only two directions in meditation. And it has to be really understood the difference between a method and a meditation direction. The two directions are samatha and vipassana, calm and insight. And vipassana is not a method, it's a result. Should I say that again? <laughs> insight is a result. Watching the breath is anapanasati, mindfulness of in-breath, out-breath, no matter where we watch it, anywhere in the body. The method is anapanasati. Vipassana, insight, is a hope for result, which I hope everybody will get to a great degree. But if we had a method that would give us insight, then we'd have it much easier. What we have are methods which train the mind to stay in one spot eventually, if we try long enough. Now, samatha and vipassana are the only two directions which exist in meditation, nothing else. doesn't matter what kind of meditation one will attempt. Samatha is calm, vipassana is insight, and calm is the means, and insight is the goal. And without the means, the goal cannot be accomplished. We call it usually in the terminology of the Buddha, skillful means. And the skillful means of calm are of the essence. And I'll explain why. The ordinary kind of mind that is familiar to all of us has a lot of movement in it because it thinks. And it thinks about all sorts of relevant and irrelevant details. It is concerned with survival with doing things in our daily life to the best of our ability so that we have no great difficulty with our survival, which is as it should be. But if we don't use our mind for anything beyond survival, we're wasting our time because it's a foregone conclusion that we're not going to survive. So we might as well use our mind <coughs> in a little um, more useful direction. Now, a mind which thinks we can compare to an ocean in which there are waves. If we are sitting under one of those waves, all we can see is the water. When the ocean has calmed down and the water has become smooth, we may be able to look underneath and see sand, coral, shells, fish. We can see beyond that which is apparent to us as the water is, we can see below. The same in the mind. As long as the mind is thinking this and that, listening to this and that, as it always does in daily life, it is very busy and therefore can be compared to the wave motion. As long as there is this wave motion and there isn't a calm, still pond, we won't see what's below the water. It just isn't possible because we will continue to think, hear, see, have touch, sensation, and all the usual things. Meditation has to be 
a mind training which takes us away from our worldly preoccupations and from our way of worldly contact so that we can attain a transcendental consciousness. As long as our consciousness remains exactly what it has always been, it's hardly likely that we should change. Everything we know, everything we do, everything we think is what we have in our consciousness. If we don't change that, there's no change in us. And if our mind training of meditation with all the um, discomforts it entails, should not bring about a change, would be a waste of time, wouldn't it? There has to be a change of consciousness. The worldly consciousness is known to us. It has the duality aspect. The duality of tomorrow and yesterday, you and mine, good and bad, liking and disliking, wanting and not wanting, judging, judgmental. It has a whole gamut of the worldly experience with which we are only too familiar and which one day comes to the point where we say there must be something else. What is it? And then meditation having become a little more known now in the West, we think that must be it. Well, that can be it. But it's got to be done in the right way. The Buddha compared one's um, approach to the spiritual path with catching a snake. If we catch a snake by the tail, it's definitely going to bite us. If we t catch it behind the head, then we've got a full grip on it. That is the way we need to approach the spiritual path and all the practice we can do in it. We've got to know where to catch it and how. And it isn't difficult, but it doesn't entail viewpoints. It entails experience. The experience that one makes oneself. The whole of the past is a do-it-yourself job. The only thing that the Buddha did was give a road map with a lot of signposts. That road map is exact, hardly to be misunderstood. But as you know, one can misunderstand any road map and go around the wrong corners. And if we have a good road map, and we are an armchair traveler, the best road map won't do anything for us. All it tells us is which direction to go. The going, the traveling, is up to each person themselves. The uh, signposts are clear. One must be willing to read them. And it isn't always directing one toward that which is the easiest. But it is always guaranteed to direct one to that which is the most useful and wholesome. Our ordinary, everyday consciousness is perfectly adequate for all our utilitarian purposes of our uh, making our livelihood of uh, our day-to-day -day living, looking after our responsibilities and duties. For that, it's perfectly adequate. For a spiritual path, it is adequate as a starter. But in order to understand the profundity of the teaching, the extraordinariness of the teaching, we need a profound and extraordinary mind. We've all got it. But 
we haven't got access to it as long as we are thinking. That doesn't mean that thinking is under all circumstances wrong. On the contrary, the mind has to play its part. But what it has to do is it has to understand and be aware of the experience which has to happen first. So if on our spiritual path we lay the stress on the experience and then use the mind to understand that, then we have the necessary tools on hand. The mind which is thinking is not only like ocean waves, but it also has constantly the ability and possibility of being negative. So it overshadows the purity of mind. It overshadows that which we can experience as a mind which has no hindrance in it, momentarily while meditating. The Buddha compared the mind to gold, which is found in its original state with five other metals in it. And before a goldsmith can use the gold, he has to heat it and remove those impurities. Then the gold becomes soft, pliable, malleable, and he can make any sort of ornament out of it. These five impurities are what the Buddha calls our five hindrances. And as long as we are thinking, they are always bound to arise, one or the other. When the mind is only experiencing, then, and there is only calm and peacefulness to be experienced, then those five hindrances are laid to rest for the time being. And at that time, we have a mind which is malleable, pliable, expandable, and the experience becomes one which takes us beyond our human problems. We can see universality because the mind has become expandable. The calm of the mind is the path that the Buddha taught. It is a means, it's not an end in itself. And our meditation practices are generally geared towards attaining some calm, which means staying on the meditation subject. It is a matter of determination and diligence to do it again and again, to stay with the meditation practice so that one can actually experience the enormously changed consciousness that comes about when real calm has arisen. The five hindrances which the Buddha spoke about, which are the impurities, of this mind, which is in its natural state, in its pure state, pure gold, are counteracted when the mind becomes concentrated. But it has to become concentrated long enough so that some change can take place. The first thing that happens when we um, meditate is that we apply ourselves to the meditation subject. That's called initial application. Now, anybody who's ever meditated knows that. We put our mind on the meditation subject. That initial application counteracts one of the hindrances which is a constant source of irritation to many people, namely sloth and torpor. Torpor is in the mind, and 
plus is the result of the body then. Because when we apply ourselves to the meditation subject, obviously the mind is alert and aware. And at that time, it cannot be foggy, nebulous, uh, lazy, disinterested and bored. These are all the states of mind that fall under the word torpor. The Buddha compared sloss and torpor with being in prison. The mind and the body are imprisoned and cannot do anything until the prison door is opened. It is a lack of energy and also it has a, as its cause very often a lack of direction in life. One doesn't know where to put one's energy. It doesn't seem uh, sufficiently uh, valuable, valuable what one is doing. So the mind wants to um, remove itself. So the initial application on the meditation subject, which does not have anything to do with becoming calm yet, but is absolutely essential to get there, is the first remedy for one of the hindrances. That initial application has to be followed up by sustained application, staying on it. The sustained application means that we don't wander off the meditation subject. We can really stay with it. Now it takes a little training. It takes sometimes some people having very good karma probably can do it rather quickly. Some people need a fairly long time. What it means is that, first of all, man has the determination to stay there. And secondly, that one doesn't allow oneself to be constantly distracted. Whenever the distraction arises, one is able to quickly come back. When the sustained application on the meditation subject has arisen, that counteracts a very insidious difficulty, namely skeptical doubt. Skeptical doubt says many things. One of them is, isn't there an easier way? Uh, is, that, is that really useful what I'm doing here? Am I really capable of, uh, of meditating properly? Does the teacher know what he or she is talking about? Was the Buddha really enlightened? Is enlightenment something so wonderful that I really should sit here all the time? <laughs> on and on, any, any number of doubts. Now, when that arises, the mind can no longer be attending to the meditation subject because it's attending to the skeptical doubt. But if the sustained application takes place, Skeptical doubt for that period of time is eliminated because first of all one sees one can do it. Secondly, one sees that, well, obviously the Buddha did know what he was talking about. It is possible. And thirdly, maybe it isn't as difficult as one thought. So a great deal of confidence arises in one's own ability and also in the practice itself. When confidence arises, it is an additional factor of strengthening one's ability to stay with it. One has confidence in what one is doing. One has far more energy to do it. So that is a very important moment when the attention really stays where we want it to stay. Because from then on, there is, it's like a snowball movement. Everything helps each other then. The confidence is already a strengthening factor. The sloth and torpor at that time has been eliminated. 
and the doubt is not allowed to arise because there are far too many other factors arising which are opposing the doubt. And if that has been successfully completed, the sustained application, the first thing that is the progressive resultant is what in Pali is called PT, P-I-T-I, which in English has many translations, all of them not quite exactly right. The most general one would be an extremely pleasant feeling. Now we can compare this to having used, let's say, the breath huh, as our meditation subject, because that's what we'll use, as a key. If we hang on to the key long enough, which means we're keeping it in our hand long enough and steady enough, we should be well able to stick it into the keyhole. And having done that, to unlock the door. Having done that, we no longer need the key because the door is unlocked. And at the time when the sustained application on the meditation subject has arisen, the breath becomes finer and finer. And having become finer and finer, the very strong, pleasant feeling which arises is surmounting the attention on the breath and becomes the most um, important factor that we put our mind on. Everybody knows when it arises because the feeling is far more pleasant than any other we've had. The, um, when it does arise, not to look for the key again because it is the factor which is inherent in the first room in that house which has eight rooms, which is the pathway through calm and tranquility. And basically, this is what everybody wants, isn't it? Peace and happiness. What yeah. else? So this is the very first indication that such a thing does happen in meditation, that one doesn't have to wait till one becomes enlightened to have peace and happiness. Although then, when one has become enlightened, peace and happiness is no longer shakable, and here it is still shakable, at least we have a little bit of an inkling that something is happening. And that's why pity is also translated as interest because that is the first moment when real interest arises not only in the meditation but in the whole of the spiritual path. It is highly unlikely that people who get to that point and that's not very difficult, mind you, will have this uh, so common off and on affair with meditation. One week they do it, next week they don't, that type of thing. Because having gained access to the result of pure mind, and at that time it's momentarily completely pure, brings so much interest in the practice that it is sustained, the practice. The interest has arisen and makes itself felt. That is first, its first benefit. But there are far more benefits than that. This third factor, having such a very, very strong, pleasant feeling with it, counteracts one of our very <coughs> unpleasant hindrances, namely ill will, which we can call anger, fury, hate, dislike, resistance, rejection, whichever word you please, they all go under the heading of ill will. Ill will is that which brings, makes, it us, makes us unhappy and also usually the people that we have ill will for makes them unhappy too. Ill will is the 
the emotion which brings so much difficulty into human lives, individually and collectively. When we have strong, pleasant feeling in the meditation, it's impossible to uh, have any ill will uh, feelings at all at that time. Naturally, they can arise again. They can arise after the meditation. But there is a very definite change also in oneself. And the change is that we now know we can get back to that feeling when we sit down in meditation. And having that as one its assurance, there is not so much dislike in one anymore. Because what happens outside of oneself is no longer seen as the cause for one's happiness or unhappiness. Having seen that the happiness arises within, that has become more important. And that is its next factor, all connected with that same third factor of the um, meditation that has become sustained on the meditation subject, namely the fact that it makes it quite clear to us that what we want from the world, it will never provide. It will not provide peace and happiness. It can only provide sensual pleasure. And that the conditions of the world will never be that which will give us what we're looking for. And therefore, we do not spend so much time and energy anymore trying to get it out there where we've tried for ever so long and it has never been totally successful, only momentarily so. This condition of meditation is strictly dependent upon concentration, whereas in the world the conditions are dependent upon outer happenings, other people being able to get what one wants and not get what one doesn't want. Since one has absolutely no jurisdiction over that, it only works part-time. It's no longer quite as interesting. That doesn't mean that one doesn't live in the world and does everything one has done before. But one doesn't search so much for getting that pleasure out there. And one doesn't become so unhappy about not getting it anymore. Because one has one's own way of doing it. Ill will is very strongly opposed to that very pleasant feeling called piti. It's sometimes called bliss um, when it's very strong. But it can be mild, strong, overpowering, or just um, very, very uh, strong feeling of well-being. With it together arises happiness. And that is the antidote for restlessness and worry. When we have happiness, it's impossible to worry. We can't do two things at the same time. And our restlessness, which leads us to look for different things in different places and leads us to search for happiness in so many different avenues, is eliminated at that time because the happiness has already arisen. We don't have to search. It's there. So what actually happens is that for the first time in one's life becomes aware of the fact that everything we want is lying inside of ourselves. It's nowhere out there. If we're still looking out there, we're only wasting time, energy, money, and thought on it. It's the first moment of becoming totally experientially aware of the fact that we've got it all within. Now, we may have intellectually known that, read it, heard it, but I don't know that, whether we've believed it until we actually experience it. The last factor is one-pointedness. 
There are five factors which arise through becoming concentrated. The first two have to do with becoming concentrated. Initial application to the meditation subject, sustained application. Then this feeling of very pleasant feeling of well-being and interest, happiness, and then one-pointedness. One-pointedness means that we're really there. And if we're really there, one-pointedly, at that time, we do not have any desire for sensual gratification. In other words, we won't know that the knees hurt and that we'd like to sit more comfortably. We don't, we won't know at that time that we'd like to eat dinner or breakfast or lunch. We don't know whether it's hot or cold because we're one-pointedly concentrated on the feeling and the happiness which has arisen, primarily the feeling of, very strong feeling of well-being, which has many different aspects, 17 different feelings, are listed by the Buddha that can arise, but there are even more than that. They are individually different. Nobody ever has any doubt when it has arisen, because it is extremely pleasant and quite different from what one is used to. And the first instance of mind may even say, oh, what's that? Naturally, then one has to start all over again. <laughs> but that's all right. Having done it once, one can do it again, particularly with a bit of guidance. So we have these five factors which counteract our five hindrances. Five hindrances, sensual desire, ill will, loss and torpor, restlessness and worry, and skeptical doubt. These five hindrances can be compared to the weeds in a garden. As any gardener knows, weeds have a habit of growing better than the flowers. Now, through our meditative experience, we will not uproot them. Calm does not uproot the hindrances. It's inside that uproots them. But what calm does is it cuts these weeds down so they become more and more frail and puny so that their root system becomes also weak and the uprooting is so much easier. And meanwhile, while, it's, while the weeds are being cut down, it leaves far more nourishment in the soil of our heart and mind for the flowers, for that which is wholesome and profitable within us. And it gives room where we can see that goodness within and know how to cultivate it and develop it. So every time we are concentrated, we are cutting down the weeds in the mind. One moment of concentration is one moment of purification. And it should never be forgotten that any spiritual path and meditation only makes sense as part of a spiritual path is a path of purification, nothing else. And if that purification doesn't take place, meditation doesn't take place. They are both intrinsically connected. Our concentration makes it possible to purify sort of automatically because of those five factors which arise in this very first aspect of meditative absorption, there's an automatic cleaning uh, project going on. But even one moment of concentration is already a moment of purification. When we first start out with meditation, when our concentration isn't very good yet, we have to work on both levels, on calm and insight. When the concentration becomes better, we use this, what I've just described, in order to get the mind to be so smooth, so even, that it is very easy then to go into depth. Now, as the mind is not 
so concentrated. We have to use whatever we can in order to make the meditation useful. Naturally, we will try initial application and sustained application. We will try to apply ourselves to the meditation subject and try to stay on, stay on it. However, between the two, there's a gap. Between the initial application and the sustained application comes the discursive thinking, the distraction. So we'll have to do something with that gap, with, the, with those thoughts. For those people whose thoughts are like fleeting clouds and do not have any solidity to them and do not even take them away from the attention on the breath, there's nothing else to be done except renew the determination. But for those where the thought becomes quite solid, and takes one away from the breath completely. We need to label them. And not just thinking, thinking. That we know already. We know we're thinking. But what we want to label is what kind of thought it is. Future, past. Hoping, wondering, worrying, boredom, dislike, um, remembering, nonsense, whatever it may be, the very first label that comes to mind, this does two things. The label dissolves the thought because it means that we're no longer involved in the thought, but we are now a neutral observer of it. So it dissolves it. But at the same time, a proper label gives us some insight into our thinking pattern and it will have a very definite result in our daily living we will no longer believe everything we think and that's going to be a great advantage a lot of our arguments will be totally superfluous a lot of our viewpoints will be lost we just will know that all these thoughts just arise and disappear again. So the labeling gives us some insight, and particularly into a pattern that we seem to have. Many people have, not everybody. Some people have a pattern of planning. They just can't stay in the moment. So they see that quite clearly, and it's helpful. Because if we're constantly planning, for instance, constantly planning, we'll never get to the breath. We cannot possibly watch a breath which is in the future. We've got to watch a breath, which is now. So getting to know oneself a little more in detail is a very helpful insight procedure. Staying on the breath is calm. Now, this is what we need to distinguish. When are we practicing to gain insight, and when are we practicing to gain calm? When we're trying to stay on the breath, and sustain our concentration, we're trying to practice calm. When we understand what kind of thought processes are going on and see them as coming and going, we're practicing for insight. Both are, can be practiced uh, jointly because the concentration isn't good enough yet to come to real calm. We use whatever we can to gain some insight because a little bit of insight will produce a little bit of calm. If one sees after some hours or days that all the thinking is totally useless, doesn't produce anything, the mind very often gets tired of it all and says, well, all right then, and starts really paying attention to the breath. So a bit of insight brings calm, a bit of calm brings insight. They help each other. As they help each other, we gain benefit from both. The same applies to the feelings which arise. We can gain insight from those. If the mind is not totally concentrated, we will notice unpleasant feeling after sittings for some time. Most people do, not everybody. Now we can notice that the mind immediately gives a signal 
to get away from that unpleasant feeling. Move, change. Now the change which we are constantly engaged in our daily lives is nothing else but trying to get away from dukkha, from unpleasant feelings. Here in the meditation we've got enough time to observe that quite carefully and stop ourselves from doing the usual pre-programmed reaction. What happens is that there is a touch contact because let's say the leg is on the um, mat and from this, this is a sense contact, the touch contact. From all contacts, all sense contacts, comes a feeling. It's not possible not to have a feeling. There are three kinds, there are only three kinds of feeling. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. And since we don't mind the neutral ones, because at least they're not unpleasant. From that feeling, the next step is a perception which says pain, the namer, very much bound up with memory. And the next step after that is the mind reaction, which says, I don't like it, I've got to get away from it. Now, it's very helpful to become acquainted with this sequence, which doesn't only happen in meditation, it happens constantly to us. There's sense contact, there's feeling, perception, mental reaction. It happens all the time. So if we become aware of that, we can eventually become master of our reaction. We don't have to have pre-programmed reaction. And not having pre-programmed reactions makes life much easier. So when we realize that we have now, again, reacted in the same way, trying to get away from the unpleasant feeling, we may be able to stop ourselves and detach our attention from that feeling and go back to the meditation subject. Then it calls again because it's very unpleasant. Then we can see its movable nature, we can see that it can't really be called mine because it came on its own. If it was mine, why didn't I bring a pleasant one? Why did I bring an unpleasant one? We can see that the body is never quite satisfactory. It's a very important insight. All these are insights into oneself. And then eventually, when the mind says, oh, this is all very interesting, but I've had enough, then move. Move gently and slowly, so not to disturb your own mind or the neighbor's mind. And say to yourself, this time the unpleasant feeling has won. It's all right. But it is much more important to be aware of what's happening than to try to sit with clenched teeth or with the pride of being able to sit through it. That is nothing but a hate situation and doesn't bring any benefit at all. It's much better and much more uh, profitable to realize what is actually going on and then see it as a natural sequence. If the mind is trained somewhat, one can detach. And having been able to detach from this unpleasant feeling once and not having immediately reacted to it by moving, gives a great deal of self-confidence that one doesn't always have to react. One can detach. But only if the mind is equanimous, even-minded. Not if the mind has anything else in it except that it's all right, I'll go back to the meditation subject. Anything else is detrimental. Trying to make it, trying to show, trying to be, all that's det detrimental. Sitting through, that brings about a lack of real feeling for the meditation as a very um, helpful practice. It brings, about, it brings with it a sort of a feeling of it is a very difficult thing to do. The Buddha said in order to meditate successfully, one has to be comfortable in mind and body. But we don't just move. We first check it out, what it's like. So we gain insight into 
their thoughts, what kind, and how they are always coming and going. We gain insight into the feeling, how it is, so to say, um, pushing us around. We don't have our own jurisdiction. We are constantly reacting to that feeling. So we can change that at least momentarily. And so these are two steps for insight. Getting back to the breath, the step for calm. I will now explain five different ways of watching the breath. And you pick the one you like or the one you're used to. And use that for the session. Then, if you're feeling that it's not successful, you like to try another one, by all means do. But give each method at least a whole meditation session. Don't change after five or ten minutes. Give it a whole meditation session. The first and most uh, well-known way is to watch the breath at the nostril. Watching the breath at the nostril, where the wind of the breath makes a feeling appear at the nostrils, which helps one to stay there with one's concentration. The feeling right here at the nostrils and the breath going in and out. Now, it's not thinking about the breath. It's not telling oneself anything about the breath. It is strictly Letting the mind and the breath become one. Now this is the most one-pointed way of doing it, but it is also the most difficult. I suggest to those who have either not practiced before or have only practiced for a short time to use something which has more of a clutch to it. The next possibility is using counting. Now one should know about one's own mind, whether it is comfortable with numbers, with words, or with pictures, or with feelings. This first one is the most one-pointed one. It hasn't any crutch to it at all. It just is like that. The next one is numbers. One on the in-breath, one on the out-breath. Two on the in-breath, two on the out-breath. However, it can also be done. One on the in-breath, two on the out-breath. Three on the in-breath, four on the out-breath. Perfectly all right. doesn't matter. These are only methods. Now, usually we say don't go any further than ten. Some people don't like that. They want to keep going. By all means, do. doesn't matter. But every time the mind goes off on a tangent, back to one. Because otherwise the mind says, oh, was I at four or was it actually nine? Or maybe I've got as far as 12 already. So we have a whole story going rather than getting back to the meditation. Always back to one. Doesn't matter which way you count. This is for people who feel comfortable with numbers. You can use a word. You can use, for instance, peace on the in-breath, peace on the out-breath. This is a very suitable word because the mind is meant to become calm. Peace in, peace out. You can also use love on the in-breath, peace on the out-breath, or vice versa. Doesn't matter. Use your own inventiveness, whichever suits you best. If you like words, these are two good words to use. However, any word will do. It doesn't matter. It is usually better to use just one word and not several. But if the mind just cannot manage to stay on that, two words is all right too. One on the in-breath, one on the out-breath. When you use a word like that, it is very often helpful for people to not just use the word, but have the, the understanding of the word with it. Like when you breathe in, you breathe in peace and fill yourself with it. And when you breathe out, you breathe out love and give it to people or surround yourself with it. 
So it is good to not just use the word, but have the meaning of the word with it. It helps the mind to stay with, with the um, meditation subject. Anything is better than discursive thinking. If the mind is very visually inclined, it can be very helpful to use the breath and visualize it as a cloud. It comes out of the nostrils and becomes bigger as a cloud. It goes back in and has to get smaller to fit back in. Any visualization will do. If people are visually inclined, if they have a uh, very often uh, the visual arts, if they're engaged in visual arts, that is a kind of mind that is helped by visualization. So using it as a cloud, comes out as a cloud, expands, and then shrinks again and comes in as a cloud. And the last one, the fifth one, is to fill the body completely with breath and attend to the feeling which arises from that, which means breath plus feeling, and then let the breath go out again and attend to the breath and the feeling. Become aware of both. These are five different methods. Pick the one you like. Any questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. No. No, don't make it any more. It is just an awareness of the fact that the breath actually doesn't stop right here at the nostrils, but it keeps going. It goes through the nostrils, comes down, and fills the body. It goes to the lungs, and it also goes to the stomach. So you become aware of as much of it as you can. You don't do anything special. And with that, there's also a feeling to be noticed. And that helps, again, to stay with the subject, with the meditation subject. All right? No, mostly just in here. Just in the, let's say the trunk, huh? Yes. And uh, then let it, follow it how it goes out again. Yes. That's exactly what I meant. I don't mean emotion. I meant physical sensation. There's a physical sensation uh, uh, also apparent at that time. And that helps again. It's not just the breath, huh? Yes. When you're watching the breath, then uh, you have a feeling as if you're hitting some uh, manifestation of emotion that has been trapped in the body, and anger or, or tears arise. Okay. Um, if that arises, you take one look at it and drop it and back to the breath, because that is the uh, purification process. You see, when we drop it, at that time, and do not react to it anymore by looking at it, by becoming angry, by uh, worrying about it. In other words, we do not give it any more a power. We just see it and drop it. That is a purification aspect. And if when we do uh, after on um, Monday, we'll do the um, uh, the sweeping, which is very much geared uh, towards. Uh, of purifying those pockets which have settled. But when it's on the breath, watching, dropping, breath. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, I would like you to try what I have said, okay? And uh, see how you go. Okay? Something new has been added. Yes.
No, you don't want to go back to anything. When you when you haven't, you mean that you haven't labeled the thought. Yeah, well, just forget it. Next one. There's always another one. <laughs> okay, what, anything else? Now imagine that you have a beautiful white lotus flower growing in your heart which opens all its petals until it's fully open. And a golden stream of light comes out the center of the lotus flower and fills you from head to toe with warmth and light and joy and surrounds you with a feeling of well-being and love. Now direct that golden stream of light from the center of your heart to the person nearest you in this hall and fill him or her with the warmth from your heart, with light and joy and surround him or her with love and compassion. And now open your heart wider and let that golden stream of light reach out to everyone here, filling everyone with warmth and joy and surrounding everyone with love. Think of those people who are near and dear to you and let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to them, filling them with warmth from your heart, with joy and contentment and embracing them with love. Think of all your good friends. Let them arise before your mind's eye. Let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to their hearts, filling them with the depth and sincerity of your friendship, giving them warmth and love.
Think of anyone whom you find difficult to love. And let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to that person so that there's no obstruction in your own heart and remembering that everyone has dukkha. Filling him or her with your warmth, with joy, and embracing that person with your love. And now open up your heart as wide as you can, letting the golden stream of light reach out like a golden cloud to beings near and far. Giving all of them, as far as you can reach, your love and your compassion, filling them with warmth and joy. Now put your attention back on yourself. Feel the contentment within you that comes from making the right effort. Feel the joy that comes from loving and giving. The golden stream of light fill you and surround you, drenching you with warmth. Now let the golden stream of light go back inside the lotus flower and let it close its petal. And then anchor the lotus flower in your heart so that it may become one with. May beings everywhere have joy and contentment. 